Good morning. We want to welcome you to Riverlawn Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Chris Kilbert. This is the third Sunday of Easter. And just to mention, we don't only worship our risen Savior during the Easter season because we come on Sunday because Jesus was raised on a Sunday. So we rejoice in our risen Lord that we are always able to come into his presence to give him the praise that he is due, to be in awe of his majesty, of what he has done for us, what he has conquered for us, who we are in him. So we rejoice on this third Sunday of Easter. We're glad that you could join us. Uh, we hope the opportunity to, to see you down the road too. Uh, we have our outdoor worship. Uh, we're gonna, we meet at 1030 on Sundays on the parking lot right now. We invite you to be a part of that uh, one day. I mean, we also encourage you to see what's going on uh, in the life of the church, whether that is on our website, riverlawnchurch.org, or uh, on our Facebook page, Riverlawn Church SA. Uh, if you have questions, you can uh, call us. Uh, you can send us an, an email. Uh, my email is rpc.pastor at sunlink.net. Uh, we just want to make sure you have an opportunity to communicate with us and, and with us with you. We want to foster that connection and continue to, to be able to, to grow in faith and to learn how we can be those disciples that follow after our Savior who is alive and reigning. I want to mention a couple things as we get started. Uh, our, we have our prelude that Pam has prepared for us, which is 10,000 Reasons. And if you don't know that song, I encourage you to uh, maybe look it up so you can also know the lyrics as well. It's bless the Lord, O my soul, I worship his holy name. And this morning we're gonna learn all about why we sh our soul should bless the Lord and why we're able to worship his holy name, uh, the one who's conquered sin and death for us. So let us prepare for worship.
Thank you, Pam. And as we continue to worship, let's go before the Lord in prayer and confession. Would you pray with me? Risen Lord Jesus, help us to empty ourselves of all that hinders our awareness of your presence with us. Forgive us when we choose to trust in the claims of the world rather than in your living hope and sure promises. Fill us with the joy of knowing your continuing presence so that like those travelers on the road to Emmaus, we too hasten to share this great good news with others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now hear this word from Acts chapter 3. Peter said to the people, You disowned the holy and righteous one. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. This is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In this we hear the good news of the gospel, that in Christ Jesus, because of what he's accomplished in his suffering death and resurrection, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. And so in that spirit of freedom and of joy and of awe, let us sing together, He has made me glad. I pray that's the song of your heart, and that may be our prayer as well. Uh, he has made us glad. We're able to enter his gates. We're able to do so because of what Christ has accomplished. So let's turn to God's word. Let's turn to Luke chapter 24 and hear this amazing story. Hear the word of the Lord. Now that same day, Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still. Their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people, the chief priests 
and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, how slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we pray as we hear your word, just like those disciples, may our hearts burn, may our eyes be opened. May we see you, Jesus. We pray in your name, amen. A preacher tells the story. When I was a young minister, I was asked by a funeral director to perform a funeral for some a homeless man who had no family. And the funeral was way out in the country. It was in a place where no other person had been laid to rest. And as one unfamiliar with that area, with those backwoods, I quickly got lost. And being that typical man, I did not ask for directions. And so I was an hour late. And I saw the backhoe and, and the crew eating their lunch, but the hearse I couldn't find. I apologized to the workers for my tardiness and, and I stepped to the open grave where I saw that the vault was already in place. And I assured the workers that I would not take too much of their time, but that this was the proper thing to do. And so the workers gathered around as they continued to eat their lunch. And as I preached, the, the workers began to say, Amen, Amen. And I began to preach like I never preached before. I wasn't going to let this homeless man go out without someone taking notice. And so I closed that funeral with a prayer. And then I went back to my car. And as I was opening the door, I overheard one of the workers say, I've never seen anything like that before. And I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. See, there's no one here to laugh, but I'm hoping you're laughing. Today is the third Sunday of Easter. And we're here to say that there is no person in that tomb, in that grave that he is risen. And so we gather this Sunday and we gather every Sunday because Jesus was raised on a Sunday. And so Christians around the world today continue to celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the grave and he is alive. And you know, we do this because we need to. Would you agree with that? 
that we need to? Because we need the hope that the resurrection gives us. Yes, we gather, we worship because we're Easter celebrants, but also because we're people with problems. Let's be completely honest. We can be in pretty desperate places. Maybe we are right now. You know, we can be courageous and we can be fearful. We've had victories. We've had defeats. Some Sundays we're inspired. Others we want to sleep in. Some days we're excited to be alive. Other days, not so much. Where are you right now? Where are you? See, we can be Cleopas at the start of the Emmaus Road, or we can be the Cleopas at the end of it. Which one are you? Today we'll learn that choosing the latter over the former is the most, decision, most important decision that we can make. So I want us to look at two things, the gospel according to Cleopas and the gospel according to Christ. Let's first look at Cleopas. Our drama begins as two players come onto the stage. One is named Cleopas. That's all we know about. We're not told anything else. Just his name. And we know even less about the second actor in the play, as he or she is never named. Maybe this person was the wife of Cleopas, maybe his brother, maybe a dear friend as they traveled back to that home in Emmaus. But you see, this is part of the beauty of the story because they are every man, they are every woman, every one of us at some point in our lives. It's meant to be something we're able to relate to. And so what's the setting? It's that very first Easter Sunday, the greatest day in human history, the day that God's son rose from the grave, defeating sin and death and Satan and hell. The day that he fulfilled the promises of God's word and God's plan and purchased salvation for all who would put their trust in him. It was the day that the world was changed forever. But Easter has missed Cleopas and his companion. No Christ the Lord is risen today from their lips. No, up from the grave he arose. They're shuffling off from Jerusalem to their home in Emmaus, a, a small village about seven and a half miles west of the holy city, a place known for its medicinal springs of the area, but really not much more. Just like we don't know much about the travelers, Emmaus, we don't know much about either. It's, it's just it's like trudging from St. Albans to Dunbar. The sun is setting on their day and it's setting on their souls. But somehow they know a lot about this one who was crucified two days ago. They know that he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. God's spokesperson and preacher. They knew that he had been crucified. They had hoped that he was going to be their Messiah, the one who was going to redeem Israel. And many had a specific idea of what that meant, more nationally and politically rather than eternally. Perhaps they had been part of that jubilant crowd a week earlier during the triumphal entry, throwing their palm branches before Jesus and their hosannas in the air. A lot happened in just a week. And now, on this Sunday, they've heard rumors from some of the women that he is in fact alive. And many doubted and did not believe. And this is where we are. And so what we see is that they know all about this Jesus, but do they know him? After all, Jesus is right there. He's walking beside them, but they are kept from recognizing him. Why? Why are they kept? Why is it that they cannot recognize him? Was it their grief? Was it their lack of expectation? Maybe they had been followers of Jesus for a while, but the crowds were always so big that maybe they just never got a good look at him. Or maybe the sun was in their eyes that entire time on that road 
until they got to Emmaus, and even not until the meal was happening. Or maybe, maybe the text makes it clear that they were kept from recognizing him until that perfect moment, until the breaking of the bread, that it was in that moment we hear they recognize him. But that moment has not yet arrived. In this moment of shattered hopes and dreams, they appreciate Jesus for the good man that he was, but really nothing more. No living, life-transforming Lord for them. Not yet. And so, you know, think about today. Really, the, the disillusioned Cleopas is alive and well and skeptical today. Richard Dawkins, who has published bestsellers like The God Delusion, has said that religion is the virus in the software of humanity. And there are many who agree with that sentiment, share that sentiment, that the resurrection of Jesus is a dangerous myth and that faith in, faith in such is an unhealthy superstition that we must outgrow. That our faith is dangerous. Depends on how you look at that. Well, maybe you wouldn't go that far. But perhaps, perhaps some of us listening, watching today, aren't really sure if it's all really true. You've, you've never seen Jesus. You've never touched Jesus. You've never heard his voice. It's all a nice story. Fine for those who want to believe it. We know churches do all kinds of good things in the world, in their communities. And so if faith helps you get by, there, there's nothing wrong with that. Do whatever works for you. It's a lovely story, a cherished tradition. But that's about it, right? Nothing more. Perhaps for you, Jesus was a good man, even a great one. A wonderful teacher, a wonderful example, one we ought to imitate, honoring his memory, continuing his legacy. But as a man, right? as one of us, just a man. And so the thing is, you can find Cleopas all over in the culture, but you also find Cleopas at the beginning of that road in the church. Perhaps you accept the story of Easter, the events of Easter on the level of history, this idea that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And as uh, historians would say, well, that would have been April 19th, 29 AD. And you know, as you look at the evidence, as you consider the, the facts, as you study and intuitively, that really, there's no other good explanation for the empty tomb. There's really no good other explanation for the birth and explosion of the church, of those willing to die for a lie, if he didn't raise, be raised from the dead. And so you understand maybe the historical side and you understand the theological importance of the resurrection, that Easter fulfilled those biblical predictions that the suffering servant would rise from the dead, that it proved Jesus' divinity, that it guarantees our victory over death and the grave. Maybe you know all about that. But to you, it sounds more like religion without relevance. That it really hasn't touched you today. That it's been a while since you felt the touch of his power. Or the answer to your prayers. Or his help for your needs. That it's been a while since you were filled with his joy. Or changed your life. Perhaps for you, Easter, it's a grand story. A wonderful story. And not much else. Perhaps you feel like you're with Cleopas. You're on the road with him. Disillusioned. Maybe downcast. So now let's look at the gospel according to Christ. Fortunately, Luke's Easter drama doesn't end in the middle of the Emmaus Road. In response to the, the misgivings and doubts of Cleopas, the incognito Christ preaches a sermon that I would love to hear in heaven. And this is the greatest summary in all of scripture in one verse. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Greatest sermon probably ever, ever said, ever told. 
And it was then that these two travelers begin to marvel. They are astounded. They are in awe. Why? Why? Because hearing the word of God leads ultimately to the worship of God. And so Jesus shows himself alive in the word of God and in the worship of God. Well, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus shows himself alive. And how does he do so? Jesus does not only point to himself in the scriptures, right, in the word. The grand unveiling comes soon after when they are at table together in a place not only of precious fellowship, but of powerful worship. Again, does that seem strange? Well, just days earlier at Passover, Jesus celebrated a meal with his disciples that he had longed to celebrate with them. A meal where he established a new covenant in his blood. A meal pointing to Jesus as the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sin of the world. A meal prompting remembrance. A meal invoking worship. And now, just a few days later, these travelers, having arrived at their destination, invite the stranger to stay with them, and they have dinner with him. The passage continues. When he was at table with them, listen, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. Does that sound familiar? Does it? Pointing to exactly what happened just a few days before in the Last Supper, which for us has not been the last. As the people of God, the Lord's Supper was remembered and participated in in that room, and we've been doing it ever since, all pointing back to that new covenant that Christ established in that upper room on that Thursday. And so, in the same practice of what Jesus did, in this pattern of the new covenant, it was then, in this moment of worship, we, say, we hear, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we walked and talked with him along the road and he opened the scriptures to us? This is how Jesus has shown himself alive. Jesus showed himself alive in the word. He showed himself alive in the worship. And he shows himself alive now, finally, in the world. We see this in the last verses, verses 33 and following. They got up. Remember, they just said that they told him to stay with them because it was getting late. It says right then, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They weren't going to wait till the next day. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way. How Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is a wonderful story. This story is one of my absolute favorites because it is jam-packed with symbolism and significance. It's laden with revelation and redemption, leading to amazement and awe. It's a wonderful story, but none of those are the reason it's so powerful. It's powerful because it's so much more than a story. The end of this story would have been an extraordinary ending, but that's just it. It hasn't ended. It didn't end in Emmaus. It didn't end in Jerusalem. It didn't end 2,000 years ago. Jesus is still alive in his word, in his worship, in his world. Now for any of us who will do what Cleopas and his companion did. If we will listen to God's word and to God's Holy Spirit, if we will meet God in his worship and in his world, if we will settle for nothing less than that personal prevailing relationship with the risen Christ, then, then it will be ours, yours, today. 
So let me ask you, when last did you start the day walking with Jesus, giving it to Jesus? I'll be completely honest. There's some days I get up and I go right into things instead of pausing and joining Jesus in that day, knowing that he walks with me. When last did you go into the world in prayer, walking with him through that day, turning to him in your problems as well as your opportunities, your joys as well as your frustrations? When last did his word and worship change and empower your soul? When last was that? Let me ask you, is Easter the story of Cleopas or is it the story of Christ? Have you come to give thanks to a good man or to meet God? Why have you come today? So we wrap up, I'm going to share another story. It was 95 AD. Many years earlier, John had been one of Jesus' closest friends, one of the very first to join his apostolic band, and now the last to leave it. The only disciple who was actually there at the cross, whom Jesus had entrusted his mother, his beloved disciple. Well, now six decades have come and gone and all the other disciples are now with Jesus in heaven. Only John remains of the original 12. And he's been exiled by Emperor Domitian to the prison colony island of Patmos, the Alcatraz of the ancient world. And separated from his family, his friends, his congregation, his witness silenced and his ministry over. At least, that's what the emperor's plan was. But early writings say that John won his jailer to Christ. You see that happen quite often in the New Testament. Won his fellow prisoners to Christ and started a tiny church on that island rock. That that place became a holy place of worship. Again, time went by. It was Sunday. John was worshiping the Lord. Because it was Sunday, the day his Savior rose. When there came a voice that he had not heard in all of those decades. And he turned and found his best friend. The one he, he never thought that he would see this side of heaven. The one who had risen from the grave. And who is alive today. And the glorious, radiant, risen Christ gave John the revelation, the last book of scripture, truth, which is still changing souls around the world 2,000 years, 20 centuries later. We've done a recent series on this book, and it is so amazing to witness the hope, the call, the message for the church, and just as relevant today, if not more. Now, a few more years have passed. The mission was executed, replaced by Emperor Nerva. Nerva actually freed John to return to his home in Ephesus. And so he left that prison island, never knowing what would become of that little church there. And being close to 100, he died soon after and went to join the Savior who had never stopped loving him. Now, 2,000 years have passed. But you know what? Today, you can still enter John's cave on Patmos. There you'll find a table where it's said that the book of Revelation was written. There's also something there, a handhold that John used to get up, that he would grab to pull himself up after he had been kneeling and praying to the Lord. And there, you will also find the enduring church. Definitely the most important. Worshiping Jesus in the cave ever since John left. And they will be continuing to worship until Jesus returns. All because the risen Christ brought Easter to Patmos. And he never left. We still worship the living Christ. He's with us by the power of his spirit. He communes with us. Not only when we have that last supper, that Lord's Supper together but by the power of his Holy Spirit, the 
The risen Christ communes with us even now. And so the risen Christ has brought the resurrection to you and to me. Have you encountered him? Have you? Has your soul been stirred by his words? Have your eyes been opened to his presence? Are you the heart broken Cleopas on the road staggering? Or are you the heart burning Cleopas on the road sprinting? On the road sprinting? Where are you? And what's the message that you carry? The message about the Messiah. Jesus, a good man dead and gone. Or the great I am, alive forevermore. Do you believe it? Will you share it? Today, you are walking to Emmaus. And Jesus has come and joined you. He is ready to walk with you through this day. Are you ready to walk with him? Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are alive. We thank you that by your spirit, you are with us. So stir our hearts and open our eyes that we may be in awe, that we will not take it for granted, that you will empower us for your purposes, and that we will proclaim to one and all, it's true, he is risen. He is alive. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And amen. This is a time in our worship where we respond. As we've heard, as we've rejoiced, as we've been in awe, we have this opportunity to respond through our living, our serving, and our giving. So again, we want to thank all those who have supported the life, mission, and ministry of the church as you've sent in your gifts, your tithes, and offerings. And this is a time of worship where you are able to set that apart, to dedicate that unto the Lord. And as you do so, we're going to hear Riverlawn's choir sing for us, I will be with you. As we've heard this morning, Jesus walking with us, always with us, I will be with you. Let's continue to worship.
Thank the River Long Choir. And now let's dedicate these gifts unto the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, like the disciples at Emmaus, we offer what we have. They offer their company, their home, their table, their bread. We invite you to be with us as we offer you our love, our devotion, our service, and these gifts. May our eyes be opened to your holy presence, now and always. Amen and amen. As we continue, continue to worship, we come to what we call the, the pastoral prayer, the prayer of the people. And we also want to let you know if, if you have something on your heart, if you know someone who is in need, make sure you've, we wanna make sure that we, we don't betray confidence, but we also, if, if you have something that you would like to share that you're wrestling with or we can be lifting up in prayer, you can send me a text, you can reach out to me by phone call. Uh, we wanna be able to, to, to lift you up. If that's something we can post on our email prayer band or include in our prayer concerns and our, our communications, we wanna be able to do that. But this is a time of our worship now that we're able to lift one another up, and not only ourselves, but our community and our world as we trust in and seek our living, powerful Savior. So let's pray together. Jesus, risen one, again, like those travelers, we struggle to recognize you in the everyday journey of our lives. So open our eyes to your work, your work of transformation in and around us. Lord, as we walk with you day by day, may your new life be made manifest in what we say and do. Lord, give us the graciousness to, to make all of our conversations holy. And just as we desire that our speaking be holy, may our seeing be holy as well. Lord, we're bombarded with images every day that shape our thinking and living. So as you've opened the scriptures to the disciples, open our eyes to behold you in your word. And in our seeing, help us to recognize and to welcome the stranger in our midst, knowing that we are welcoming you. Lord, you come to us in unexpected places, in a journey on a dusty road, in conversations, in the stillness. You come in the midst of our doubt, our fear, our sorrow. You come in the power of the resurrection. No pain or suffering is unknown to you. You bring your peace, peace to the conflicts within us. Lord, you're a friend. When we are alone, unseen, you are there. So often we forget, Lord, that you invite us to abide with you, to have our lives hidden in you. May it be so as you journey with us in our joys and our sorrows. Lord, we lift up those in the midst of such. You know them. We pray that by your spirit you comfort and minister to them so that they too are aware of your presence, have lifted and moved to proclaim our wonderful Savior. And so, Jesus, we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so we're going to proclaim, just like those travelers, just like those disciples, just like the women, that he lives. Let us sing together, my Redeemer lives. I know he rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin and I leave. I believe my shame is taken away, my pain is given his name, I believe, I believe, I'll raise the banner, cause my Lord has conquered the grave, my Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. I know He rescued my soul, His blood has covered my sin, I believe, I believe, my shame. He's taken away My pain is healing His name I believe I believe I'll raise the banner Cause my Lord has conquered the grave My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. You lift your burden, and I'll rise with you. I'm dancing on that mountaintop to see your kingdom come. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives, 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 he lives. He lives. Amen. Amen. And let's continue to sing and pray and proclaim our Savior, risen and reigning. In a moment, Pam will be playing our postlude. When we continue to worship, we want to thank her for that, which is Shine, Jesus, Shine. You may know that praise song. And it's a prayer as well, asking Jesus to set our hearts on fire to send forth his word, to, to grant this world, world eyes to see the radiance of the risen Christ. And so with that, we offer this benediction. Go now as witnesses of Christ's eternal presence. The risen Christ has made himself known to you. So set your faith and hope on Jesus, living his love and sharing his life. And may the Spirit of Christ open your eyes and set your hearts on fire. Go now to love and serve your Lord. Amen and amen. Thank you for worshiping with us.